Hello, welcome everyone to another episode of the Osborne Group Chat. My name is Laurel McCombs. I'm the Senior Philanthropy Advisor at the Osborne Group, and I am super excited today to be joined by three people who I've had the pleasure of working with uh, over the course of the last year or so uh, from Cal State Fullerton and now Cal State Long Beach, uh, but we'll get into that more in a minute. Um, I had the opportunity last year, I was a, a, the Osborne Group was approached by Cal State Fullerton last year uh, to do a series of trainings that is not something we typically get approached to do. And um, you're gonna hear more from our guests about kind of what the impetus for these trainings were, but essentially uh, it we were looking at power dynamics in fundraising and recognizing that as fundraisers, we get put into some interesting slash difficult slash awkward situations at times because of some of the power dynamics that exist in philanthropy. Um, so I'm not going to spoil all of the stories and all of the, the kind of the process for how we got there, but um, I'm really excited to be joined by three people who were really instrumental in this process, in this project, um, Carlos Leja, Katie McGill, and Alina Mercia Trotz. Um, actually, I'd love for each of you to just uh, quickly introduce yourselves. Uh, Carlos, why don't we start with you? Um, Carlos Leja, I'm the Associate Vice President for College and Program Development at Cal State Fullerton. Katie? Hello, I'm Katie McGill. I'm Executive Director of Development at Cal State Fullerton. Okay. Alina? I am Alina Mercia Trotz and I am the um, Executive Director of Strategic Initiatives at California State University, Long Beach. Great. And just to, to you know, for everyone uh, watching this, when we did the project, of course, Alina was then at Cal State Fullerton, but has since then uh, gotten a wonderful new opportunity at Long Beach. So I'm glad she was able to come back and join us. Um, so Alina, we're actually gonna start with you because this, this whole process and this whole project really started with you. And uh, I, I've just, it's been such a pleasure to get to work with you over these this last eight or nine months and hear your stories and share stories with each other. I mean, you and I have spent some time just kind of swapping our, our own war stories of, of our, you know, I won't say how many years uh, in fundraising. Uh, but uh, so I'd love for you to just kind of talk to us a little bit about what your experiences has, have been and, and what prompted you to bring this issue to leadership. Thank you, Laurel. And I have to say, side note, it's been wonderful working with you as well. And thank you for putting this together today. Um, I hope that it's able to, to help others out there um, as, as they look at you know, their careers. Um, so when I first, I'm gonna share a little bit about my story. When I first began my fundraising career, um, now 22 years ago in May, um, fresh out of college, you know, I never imagined the meaningful professional relationships that and friendships that we would build over the years that I would build with donors. I never imagined the, the legacy that I would be, I would have the honor of helping to create. Um, the energy that we experience as fundraisers as we gently help donors experience the joy of giving um, is really so fulfilling and that that's been so rewarding my, throughout my career. I also never imagined um, and, and wasn't prepared for, you know, the difficult power dynamics that have ha that I've experienced over the years in working with donors, um, and you know, the extent to which our own profession may have unintentionally allowed that cycle, and in the words that we've used, in the way that we've um, we've just talked about our profession. And, and so that, that's something that looking back now, it, it's interesting to see how different tweaks along the way may have changed that. So, uh, you know, a few, a little bit about my story. A few years in my career, I worked with a donor who, who served as a development chair um, for, for the organization's board. This individual was close with the CEO at the time. And, um, and they just had a, a close relationship. And I was working on helping to build corporate and foundation relationships. Um, and that, that donor compared the fundraising process to the dating relationship. 
in every conversation, that's how it was. Alina, when we when we get to the first base with, with this prospect, right, we'll get that kiss. And when we get to second base with that prospect, we'll, we'll take off our clothes. And, you know, our ultimate goal is to get to home plate where we have sex. And, and it's, and it was just so nonchalant the way, a matter of fact, the way that, that he talked about it. And it wasn't only in those meetings, it was in meetings with others too. And looking around the room, it just didn't phase anyone, but that just seemed to be okay. Right. And, and it was startling that the donor just didn't feel anything, that there was anything wrong with that analogy. Um, and, and that was just so interesting to me as a young fundraiser that that just seemed to be okay. And so I remember, um, I remember talking with the vice president about that and we rectified that, you know, we had a conversation with that donor and the donor apologized and, and didn't use those analogies anymore in our meetings with, with, with him, right? But I don't know if that continued. Um, you know, as I progressed in my years, these types of experiences just became more frequent. Touches became more intimate and suggestive. Hugs became uh, longer and tighter with hands just moving down the back. Compliments became more sexual. And I noticed in talking with colleagues that they, um, they had had these experiences too. Conversations crossed the professional boundaries. And what was interesting is that these interactions occurred in public with others around. And yet it was, no one said anything about it. So I was baffled, right? As I spoke with my colleagues and said, I, I don't understand, how, how are you, ha how is this okay? How are you handling this? And they said, well, that's just part of the job. That's just part of our field. And, and that, was, that was just so unfortunate to hear that, right? Um, and, and I noticed that no training was provided on how to, how to handle such difficult interaction, the power play, because you're, you're a young fundraiser working with a donor who wants to give the organization, the institution a sum of money, and, and they have the power to do that, right? So you don't want to do anything that may shift that, that that may, where the donor decides to take the donation elsewhere. And, and so I think a lot of fundraisers just put up with that. But I noticed there was no discussion on how to respond in the moment when those when those happen. There's no no discussion on how to address repeat offenses. So I just learned to adapt and create my own strategies of how to handle these situations. Um, during my tenure at Fullerton, this continued, right, with both um, you know folks on campus and off campus, and 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 that was unfortunate, and yet. You know, there was an incident last year that just kind of seemed to, I think that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Because in that moment, all the experiences over the years just washed over me like an overwhelming flood. And I think it was just, this is it. This is, we have to change this. And, and I was angry that the type of behavior continued. You know, I was angry that I had to navigate through all of these on my own. I was angry that our profession over the years, I hadn't seen that they've done more to bring awareness to this. Um, they hadn't done more to provide training about how to address these situations. And yes, I looked at it over the years of, well, perhaps this, this individual doesn't know what they're doing or perhaps, you know, they're, um, it's a different culture, right? So taking, looking at it from the cultural, looking at it from the generational, the age differences and keeping all of that in context, but there comes a point in time where it's just like, you're done overlooking all of that, right? And it's, it's okay, how do we move forward so we can continue to have a professional relation, uh, discussion, a professional discussion to move uh, forward what we both want to accomplish for the institution, but without all this other stuff, right? I know my story isn't unique. And, and sadly, I'm sure that there are many others with similar stories. So in coming forward, my intention wasn't to, to necessarily go to that donor, right? It was, it was to figure out how we, the, the us, right, in this room, how we in this profession could do better to help our younger colleagues. It was to figure out how we could bring awareness about the power dynamics and advancement, how to empower advancement colleagues with strategies and tools to effectively navigate through such interactions with dignity and grace and professionalism and keeping in mind, you know, the end goal, right? 
um, how to provide greater insight for the deans and our academic fundraising partners who are our partners in, in moving forward such conversations about, about these dynamics and how they can work more effectively with their frontline fundraisers at the same time being aware, right? How are, how are these academic professionals aware of what's happening so that way they can, they can work more effectively with their, uh, their colleagues. And then also just to help change the narrative about the way we speak about our profession so that with every single conversation, we're changing the way, the way everyone is speaking about it. So that, that's, that's why I came forward. Yeah, thanks, Alina, for sharing all of that. I it's it's so funny you talk when you first shared with me the the story about the dating analogies. I I have often used dating analogies when I train on development, and you know I use them maybe a little more appropriately than your than your donor did. I, um, but <laughs> I I I had this moment where I was like, oh my gosh, I'm part of the problem, right? And and there's this, and I think there's been a lot of things for a lot of us over the past year that we we all have had opportunities i think to step back and say wow am i am i part of the problem even though i think i'm so progressive and so helpful and you know and and then and I, it's it, this whole project has made me look at certain certain stories i tell and certain you know euphemisms that i use and i've said yeah that's not helpful to this issue, right? And I think the other part of this, um, excuse me, that I think ended up happening is that I think what we realized was, um, especially especially with George Floyd, what happened last summer, um, that happened right in the middle of all of, of this project with us was that this wasn't just about sexual harassment right? This was also about issues of diversity, inclusion, racial justice, equity. Um, and so it all kind of happened at the same time. So I would actually love to kind of go to Carlos now because, you know, Alina, you were the one that Alina came to with this. You, you were her supervisor. You were uh, kind of the person who she, who she brought attention to this with. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit about once Alina came to you, um, how did you and Greg Sachs, your Vice President of, of Advancement, um, what was your discussion like, especially as two men, quite frankly? Um, you know, what was the discussion and, and how did you decide to take action moving forward? Oh, um, Elena, thank you. you. You summarized things so, so perfectly. Um, how we, how we, how we, how we responded and how we took this information and then moved from there. I think initially, um, and, I'm, and then Alina knows this because she was there, um, I was furious. Not furious at um, Alina, of course, but at, at the situation and as a, and I, and I think it's important to, to point out a, a male supervisor, you know, I initially jumped to, I'm gonna fix this and I'm gonna fix this now. And, and it was because I was just so aghast at what Alina had, has, has gone through for so, so long. And, and after through evolving the process, so if people listening and watching, if they're encounter, they encounter different, the similar circumstances with their, with their team members, you need to take a step back and listen. And, and, and then understand that um, the person that's sitting across from you, who they are, what they want to accomplish, and what also what they, what they don't want you to, to do um, to quote unquote solve the problem. Um, I think it's very important to move along with that person, um, not behind you, but right next to you to, to find a solution and to address the issue and the problem. Um, so, but, so first and foremost, you know, we, Greg, and when, I, when we ultimately talked to Greg and um, it was, it, it was, it was done with just a no more zero tolerance, but we had to take a step back and really understand the issue, understand um, what we wanted to accomplish and, and then find a way to, to, to get there um, because it's very personal. Um, and we want to be very, very respectful of, of Alina and, and, and just the dynamics of the relationships that, that we wanted to maintain, but we wanted to find solutions to, to do better and not just in this moment, but, but, but moving forward and beyond. 
and, and Laurel, I'll say the exact same thing. Um, I used, um, in many cases, following a meeting with a, with a donor, I would say, you know, this is, oh, we'll talk. This is just our first date. And it's just, and, and even though it wasn't with a suggestive, you know, um, sexual undertone, it doesn't matter. It does. It's there. It, 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 it insinuates the relationship more, more intimately than it does, you know, just talking about how we mutually accomplish a philanthropic goal. And, and, but that's how I was taught. And, and it was just, you know, I came from a time when also when, whether it was about, um, uh, um, uh, from, a, from a sexual point of view, but even just from a, a power point of view, as it relates to um, how donors would, would address um, topics of race and things that were just really inappropriate. And how leadership, when I first started out, was just, oh, that's just him. He's from that generation. And oh, yeah, you know, he doesn't mean any harm by that. And it's just, you leave and you're a little disappointed, but then you're like, oh, okay. Well then, then that's how I should address it as I, you know, move up in my positions. And when I have, you know, people encountering similar things that I encountered and said, and say, oh, that's just him or her. And they're just from a different generation, but no. And, and it's just no more. And so that's really how we, we addressed it. And when we talked to Greg and brought Greg into the conversations, he was equally as, as aghast and just said, no, we have to address this. And it was supported from the highest level of, of leadership, both with, um, within our division, but also in conversations with, with HRDI, human, human resources, um, to really find our track and our solution to provide awareness, training, and to look at the solution, not just within our own constituents within university advancement, but within our, with our academic leaders. Um, it was, it, it, it's, it's something that has to be looked at from, from multiple angles, multiple participants in how we address this, but then also to have the, the platform where we're talking about this and there's no stigma around it, that people shouldn't wait three, six, nine months, a year, or don't re talk about it at all, that we create an open dialogue and platform where we're able to talk about this and not be afraid and not be ashamed or worry about our goals. I was really proud when our vice president, Greg Sachs says, no gift is, is, is worth this. No, none of our, of our development officers or even beyond that into our government community relations, no relationship is worth any of our team members tolerating that kind of behavior. And I think there was a message there in that you know, yes, we have large goals. We have we we have really large goals to, to raise money and to generate support in support of our university and our students. But, but compromising ourselves to in this power dynamic situation is just it, it's not acceptable and it's just not going to happen. So it was a vote of confidence from our leadership that we took. I feel that we took this position and and created this training and worked with you and sought voices. Absolutely. And um, I, just, I remember that first call with you and Greg and just being, I, I think one of the things that was really uh, surprising to me was that as you were looking for consultants to work with on this, there weren't a lot of people that you even got recommendations around. And, and um, I had actually just serendipitously uh, done a, a training about six months earlier for the AFP Congress in Canada on kind of managing difficult situations. And so it was kind of like the stars kind of aligned that we found each other and, and were able to work on this together. Uh, but, you know, and we'll talk a little bit more in a minute about what the actual training uh, entailed, but I think that even more significant part of this project was uh, that you didn't just call in a consultant to do some training, but you actually created a committee around this. And I think that also, to me, really showed the, uh, the commitment and the long-term dedication that you had to this uh, issue. And so Katie, you were, I, I think besides Carlos and Alina, like the first person to jump in on that committee. And um, so I'd love to hear a little bit, if you could share a little bit more about just what the, the purpose of the committee was and why you decided to join. Sure. Um, I think, you know, as Alina shared, we all have these challenging situations um, and really uncomfortable encounters that happen in development. Um, 
especially as a woman, but um, it could it could happen to anyone. And you're not prepared for some of that. I mean, you're not prepared for that when you're going into it. You're doing it because you love development, you love your organization, you want to support, for, for example, Cal State Fullerton, our students. So you're not prepared for these obstacles that happen. And um, I know that many of the things that I've encountered, I wish that they were talked about earlier. I wish that there was a platform to say, hey, that's not okay. You know, I wish that a vice president early on had said, these are our standards and, and this is not acceptable. So having that conversation early on was really important as we're fostering and developing new development officers. I have a team that I am working with and working with developing them to be fantastic um, the frontline fundraisers. And in order to do that, you know, I want to be open about, you know, these are the things that could happen and let's talk about it now. So you're ready to have a plan in place or you're ready to have advocates there or you work together with your colleagues to make sure that you're either not put into that situation or that you're ready to respond to it. Because I think in when I, when I had in, throughout my career, I wasn't ready to respond to it. Sometimes you're a deer in the headlights and like, did they just say that? And I think we've we talked about that too when it comes to working with a donor, um, not just um, not just based on sexual comments, but also on comments that could be racist. And having someone say say something to you and you're, you're you stand back and. Did they just say that? Did, did, did they say what I thought they said? And, and how do you react to that? You know, is it a point where you ignore it? Do you provide education? And those are some of the things I think that as a committee, it was really great to have different perspectives because we had different perspectives of people that had gone through different things in their careers. And we were able to have a conversation about what do you wish you knew then that you know now that you could share with others um, and not just the frontline development officers we had conversations about you know people that are involved in gift processing our government and community relations team some of th those people also work with the community and ha have difficult situations that they come across as well so it was really important to get different perspectives on that so we were providing information and training to all of our, um, all of those in development, whether you're a frontline fundraiser or in a different role. So having those perspectives is really helpful. And I think just making it regularly comfortable to discuss, having it something that you're not uncomfortable going to your supervisor about saying, I'm open to this conversation. If you ever want to talk about it, I'm here for you. Knowing that there's also a committee and advocates within your division, that it doesn't have to be your supervisor. You could go to someone else within your division and have this conversation with them um, without judgment. And they would help you through it and, and figure out how to uh, address it, combat it, give, giving suggestions as well. So I think that that was really why I wanted to join the committee um, and help prepare future future development officers, but also um, make it okay, ha make it okay to talk about these things instead of not talking about them and just being left alone and uncomfortable in that situation. Yeah, and, and it was really great. The committee had representation from uh, pretty much every department. And I, I agree with Katie, I think what was really great was making this relevant to everyone. So it wasn't just about the frontline fundraise, fundraisers, but it was recognizing that, you know, if, if I'm a gift processor, what if a big donor calls and says, well, I, can, you, can you just put together a tax statement for me? And oh, come on, you can do that. And right, and what do you say in that situation? And one of the things that came up um, over the course of our committee meet meetings was this, I had this super aha moment about the fact that part of this power dynamic, of course, the core of this is money. Right. I mean, at, at its very core, anytime money is involved with anything, there's going to be a power dynamic. But the other thing that is awkward or hard about fundraisers is we are neither the person with the money nor the person who is trying to get the money. We are right smack dab in the middle of that that, you know, relationship. And so we 
don't have the ability to uh, make a decision, right? When, when we are out there on behalf of our institutions, organizations, it's not our, if somebody says something to us or does something that is uncomfortable or inappropriate, it, it's not our decision to just walk away in that moment, right? It's not our decision to just say, well, I think that was a terrible thing to say and we don't want your money, right? And so it puts us in this very weird situation where we don't get to speak for our institutions and yet we're the ones who are dealing with the awkward situations, right? The other thing that I think was really uh, illuminating during this project was the recognition that uh, for many of our, especially individual donors, um, this philanthropy oftentimes falls into their social lives, right? But we're at, at work, right? This is business for you. And so we end up, you end up having this weird dichotomy where you are in business mode working with people who are often in social mode. So you have people who are probably more willing to be more a little more comfortable, a little more loose, a little more willing to say things that they wouldn't say in a professional situation, but you're at work, right? And so that's just another part of this dynamic that makes it, but again, to Katie and Elena and Carlos's points, none of us were taught this when we came into this business, none of us, nobody sat us down and said, you might get put into an awkward situation and here's how you should deal with it, right? And and often for many of us and you know those of us in a kind of similar generation, and I think even for young fundraisers today, the response too often is, well, that's just, that's just how it is. That's just how he is, right? And so I, I think, um, you know, we kind of approached the training from the perspective of, you know, how do we give people some tools? And so that was essentially the training. We kind of, you know, and it was great because because of the pandemic, we weren't, I think initially we had hoped we could do kind of a full day in person kind of thing. Of course, that was not an option. So we ended up doing four virtual sessions four kind of 60 to 90 minute virtual sessions. Um, and we did one for the entirety of the advancement staff, which I think was great, again, in, including everyone. And I think there were plenty of people who came to those sessions who had no idea that this was a thing, that this was a thing that their colleagues experienced. So I think that was really, really great um, to you know, help people learn about that. Um, and then the second session was for deans, which I think Alina, you were really, I think, instrumental in making the case for that. And, and especially, and, and Alina and her dean uh, actually spoke uh, at that session and kind of shared their experiences, which was really great. And then we had some problem solving sessions. So we had a third session that was just breakout discussion groups to talk about how do you, how would you handle a situation? We did a little bit of kind of scenario building. And then the fourth session was really the committee kind of saying, okay, what did we hear? What are our next steps? So, you know, I think for anybody who's listening to this chat, who recognizes that these are maybe issues that are happening um, in your own institution, know that there are a lot of different ways that you can address this. But I think that the core of what Fullerton did really, really well was they uh, combined training with ongoing support, right? So it wasn't just, here's the training, go deal with it. It was, here's some training, and now we're gonna keep talking about this and giving you a safe space to come and talk about this. Um, any, Carlos, Alina, Katie, any thoughts or, you know, anything that came up during the, the course of those sessions that jumped out at you or, or anything you'd like to share about, about that process? I know, I know this related, I think one thing that's really important for people who will be listening is, is being prepared, if you implement a training like this, is to be prepared for um, younger members of the team who may not have really experienced things like this or members of the team, to your point, um, or all about, about people that may be a bit more um, isolated from the external community of our donors, like our gift processes or others, that you know the, the opportunities that exist for these things to happen. So for some people, it was a lot for them to, to digest and a lot like, well, what do you, what do you mean? And this exists in our, well, I don't get this, I don't understand it. How does this impact me and why am I hearing this? And, and it's so relevant yet so many of them don't realize that it, it, it is it is something that that is real and it's there and they need to know about. And so I think just being prepared for some of the, the younger members, I, I don't think that we were fully prepared for some of the feedback that we would get 
in, in their response and reaction to it. Nothing was bad because we had, you know, everybody was instructed, talk to your supervisors about this and, 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 and we have, so that's been great. I think ongoing though is, um, is really being able to look at the, okay, so now we see this, how do our processes and procedures mirror this and create solutions for this? Even if it relates to allocating more money for, you know, development officers not going and picking up donors from their house at, you know, at, at six o'clock and dropping them off at their home at 930, you know, that, that they're, you know, after there's been alcohol and things, just the liability that exists. So just making sure that we, we have the opportunities to be able to not put our development officers or other members of our team in a position where they have to do that. Um, and, and there's a, there's an option for them not to do that. But even just as it relates to supervisors and we're not traveling right now, but how do you, you know, how do you assess and look at travel and how do you, you know, what, what situations are, are team members going to potentially be in when you're approving travel or when um, you're talking about a strategy session? I think you have to look at it from an all encompassing point of view of, of the safety and well being of, of your team. And only because I didn't say it earlier, um, this has been one of the, in my 24, five-ish years of in, in, in this profession, this, is, this has been one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. And just a thank you to Alina um, for, for stepping up. I mean, it was a very brave thing to do. And um, that there'll be a ripple effect from the work that we're all collectively doing, not just at Cal State Fullerton, but hopefully at other institutions um, is for me just is, is really, it makes me feel really good about being part of this process. Yeah. Absolutely. And I have to go ahead, Alina. I I have to give a lot of credit to um, to the dean. You know, my my um, the dean that I had when I was at Cal State Fullerton. Um, you know, as these things had happened over the years during my tenure there, she and I talked them through and talked about solutions and employed. Um, different strategies to handle some of those, right? I mean, simple ones like Carlos mentioned, um, hiring hiring a, a, a car service so that I wouldn't have to necessarily pick specific individuals up, right? Um, but we also focused a lot on, on, on the narrative, right? She helped, um, she helped me look at advancement in our work in a way that was that I hadn't necessarily looked at it before and, and just being purposeful with the words that we're using. So for, for so the dating analogy, right? Which is not one that I ever use because I never, <laughs> that, that's just not, a, I, I felt that that was uh, wrong from the get-go, but the word relationship, if you think about fundraising, I'm not sure you could pick up any fundraising book that doesn't include the word relationship. It's all about relationship. That's what we've heard. That's what I've heard for the tw you know throughout the twenty-two year career that I've had in in this um, profession, and and it's been a rewarding career. But why can't it be all about partnerships? Why can't it be all about co uh, you know collaboration, right? If you think of the word relationship, it implies it can imply intimacy. That, that's, a, that's a word that can imply things to different folks. And if you talk about our profession as a, and what we do as a relationship, then the investment, as the investment may be in me and not necessarily in the institution or, or in the vision of the institution, right? And so that's something that my Dean helped me as we sat and, and thought about our profession and, and about how she and I wanted to move forward in the way that we communicated with donors and prospects about um, the vision for the college mm. and what we were trying to build in that college. How were we able to, we, we were strategic in the ways that we, we um, created you know, strategies to move forward in the way that we spoke about the college. Um, right. So the goal was to have an intellectual discussion about the partnership and the vision of the institution and the vision of the college. And, and because partnership for a vision is partnership for a vision, we wanted partnership for a vision and not relationship for a gain. 
Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So then if you look at it that way and the donor is able to understand that they're coming alongside you as a, as a partner and not necessarily a, you know, as, a, as something the word relationship would imply, it just changes the dynamic. It changed the way, and we we tested that um, as we spoke with different folks, and we noticed the, the the difference, the little nuances in the way we talked about things, and and we didn't have you know a chance to to continue to explore that because then I transitioned over to Cal State Long Beach, but but there's something there, mm -hmm. there's something there, and and I wish that you know this is something I would love for a profession to focus on, right? Changing the the way we speak about about advancement and fundraising and what we do. Um, that, that's, that was what was so important to me. And I wanted the younger generation, the younger folks, um, the younger us's to, to hear that, right? For me, it was all about just bringing this forward and folks being aware and, and understanding that they can talk about these things. Um, so that way, a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, it's going to be beautiful to think about how this could be, right? How, how the whole narrative can change. Yeah, absolutely. I think it was, yeah, I think it was, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think it was exciting, like to Lena's point that our academic partners were very interested in working with us on this. You know, it was surprising to some and to others, they were wanting to know how can I help? You know, we, when we did our bro breakout sessions, um, we had partners that said, yeah, you just give me the signal and I will, I will head right over there. You know, it was, how do they help us? Um, because they never really thought about the situations that we were in and that power dynamic between the donor and even our academic and campus partners. I think it was an awareness for them too, of the challenges that we face in representing them and supporting their efforts. And the, uh, many of them said, you know, how can I help? Let me know where, where can where, where can I be an advocate, um, just like uh, Alina's dean had been. So I think that was really refreshing to see too that, and it was important that we included them in that. It was really important that we included them in that so that they were more aware and understanding of those challenges that, that come about. And not just for us, I think Katie, in one of our conversations, um, in one of our meetings, so as we were going through the training, I think you mentioned this, but you know, some of the deans had mentioned to my dean um, that they had experienced things like this, and they just had no idea what to do, right? So, so it isn't just about us as frontline fundraisers or those in advancement, but but our academic partners, mm -hmm. right? They they had no idea what was appropriate for them to do, mm -hmm. and. and and, and, you know, nobody wants to do something that may jeopardize a, a big donation to the university if you think this is going to move the vision of your institution or of your college forward, right? And, and so it was important to bring awareness to them so that they understood how they could move forward and how they can navigate through those uh, situations and conversations and how they can look at their um, team member, their frontline fundraiser as a partner in doing that together, right? So, so again, it's not just looking at as, okay, you and I are raising money, but you and I, what are we doing together? And how can we do this so that we most effectively work as a team um, with the narrative we want? Absolutely. Well, I, I feel like we could keep talking for another hour where we, you know, we essentially are trying to condense like six months of work into a, you know, 40 minute call. And so, um, but I just, I just want to thank the three of you this I, I agree with Carlos I, you know, been doing this for more than 20 years and I agree I think this is maybe one of the most rewarding projects I've gotten to work on and so I want to thank Fullerton for for including me in that and letting me be part of that and, and just thank all of you for all of your courage and, and willingness to, to not just step up within your own universities, but to join me today and share this out with the world. So um, Carlos, Katie, Alina, thank you all. It's been so much, it's just been so wonderful working with all of you and thanks for joining me today. And um, I hope you all, everyone watching this uh, got something out of this. I think if nothing else know that if you've had these experiences, you're not alone. And if you want to do something about it, 
come join us because we're all trying to do something about it too. Uh, so, you know, call me. Uh, you can always go to the osborne.group.com website, uh, shoot me an email, give us a call, uh, let us know if you're interested in, in joining all of us and in, in making a difference in this. And um, again, thanks, thanks to all of you and thanks to everyone who joined us. Uh, have a great rest of your day and, and thanks so much. Yeah.